Hi, I'm Ernie Ellingson. I've been around Atlanta off and on for the last, oh, 40 years. And uh, <laughs> I've been involved with this group since about 2004. So uh, the last five years I've been living in Vermont. I'm back. Uh, it's much warmer here, <laughs> really warmer here. Uh, my friends in Vermont are telling me that I'm lucky because they have seven feet of snow on the ground. And, uh, and believe it or not, sugar season's about ready to start. And all the farmers are looking at that saying, well, <clears throat> how are we gonna get out into the fields where the trees are with this much snow on the ground? So they're, they're gonna run into a problem here, but I'm kind of looking forward to seeing what happens up there when the, when the so snow starts to melt. Today I'm gonna talk about Meteor. Has anyone heard about Meteor? Anyone know what it is? It's a, basically a JavaScript framework. Doesn't have anything to do with Ruby. Uh, so everything is written in JavaScript. It runs on Node. Uh, there's server-side JavaScript. There's client-side JavaScript. Uh, when you design your application, uh, you, you actually design it with, here's a code that runs on the server, here's a code that runs on the, on the client. So what I'm gonna do is kind of give you an overview of what happens. First of all, if you want to install it, you can do it while you're waiting here. You can just simply do curl HTTP um, install.meteor.com and pipe it to bin slash sh, and it'll install itself. It takes about three or four minutes to get it installed on your computer. And um, I'm using a Chromebook today. I'm still experimenting with this. I want to see if it works all right in audiences like this because it's really lightweight and I can carry it around and not not worry too much, and I've got a Ubuntu running on Chrome, so <laughs> it's a little strange. First of all, um, what I'm gonna do to start with is I'm simply gonna start and design um, or create an app. And all you have to do is go Meteor, and we'll just create a, a quick one. Uh, Meteor create, A-T-L-R-U-G. And it'll, and once, once we have this thing created, it, it'll, it'll set up pretty fast. Anyway, it's done. <laughs> so and it, it, you can see that it gets, and we'll take, we'll just CD to that directory. And, whoops. I do that more often than not. And uh, in this directory, I just do a, there are three files. There's an Atlanta rug CSS, which basically is empty right now. There's an Atlanta rug HTML and an ATL rug.js. So we'll take a look at each of them in pieces. And then you'll get an understanding of exactly how uh, Meteor works. So first we'll just uh, take a look at the HTML. Pretty simple. You'll notice it uses templates. And we have a simple template, and every time you create a, just a name project in Meteor, it'll give you this thing, it's their hello template. It comes in all of them, and you can start from there to doctor things around. But we'll take a look at what the structure, are. structure is. You can see that it's, it's uh, pretty simple. You'll notice up here where the hello is there, there's a double handlebar and then a greater than sign and hello. It just simply says load the hello template there, right underneath that first header H1 there. And so if we take a look at it, uh, the way you run it on, and I'm gonna, ru I'm gonna run it locally first. For those of you, I'll give you an IP address for this machine in a second. For those of you who have computers, I'll, what's interesting is Passenger, which everyone should be familiar with if you're running Ruby on Rails at all, Passenger will also run Node, Meteor, and Python. So I'll show you we can actually load this thing in Passenger and what's interesting, yeah? Sorry, would you mind making the font a little bit bigger? Um, I can try. Uh, is that, because this is the best resolution I can get here and I think, I don't know that I can make the font bigger in here. I might be able to, uh, I don't think so. Well, this is Vim, so you think, well, I, I don't know how about Vim running on this thing. 
Well, here, well, let me just, uh, I can try making it bigger, but I don't know that I'm going to. Is that better? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you figured it out right here on the spot. It's pretty interesting. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we'll just start over here, and I'll just start it by, once you're in a directory, you just start Meteor by saying Meteor. And it's starting a, a proxy, building the application, so on. And I'll, it's all running here on localhost. It's running here. And there we are. Welcome to Meteor. And you'll notice that if we go back to this, this thing where we had the, I'll go over here. You'll notice we had this, we had this uh, template in here where it says button click me, you press the button blank blank times as a thing. And if you go back here to the site, it's, it's pretty straightforward. You just start clicking on this button and you'll see that it, just that little template is incrementing the counter. It's pretty straightforward, easy to see. Now, what we want to do is uh, we want to look at what that JavaScript looks like. So we want to vim. We want to do this. Can you see that all right? Is that font size still big enough? Um, you'll notice that there's two things here. There's a thing called template helpers and a thing called template events. And that's it. That's the JavaScript. And it's, what's interesting about Meteor is it's reactive. This is it. You notice I haven't written any jQuery or anything to, or linked events to buttons or anything else. It's just here. The hello events is simply a, an object, a JavaScript object, that uh, all the events that happen is a click button, but we could have other kinds of events. We could have events, uh, a blur event, uh, or some other event going on in any object on the page, and we can put it in the events thing. And when the events go on here, you'll notice it's, it's, it's using a session.set counter. Well, the session is a built-in reactive variable. Anything that, if you do a get on session, which is what happens up there in the helper, notice that helper has a variable in it, it returns session get counter. If you have that, a getter on session, Session, anytime you make a change to the variable that's being, that's getting, that the system's getting from session, anytime you make a change, it immediately updates that variable in a template. So you don't have to worry about uh, mapping events again. You simply make a change to session down here with the counter, it changes the counter, and the template changes the, we'll split it here and take a look here. Um, you'll notice that down here it says, see that variable in a double handlebars counter? That's, it's simply a variable in the template. So when I make a change in, in the counter over there in the JavaScript by clicking the button, it immediately updates the template. So that's basically Meteor in a nutshell. You just need to worry about templates and you have to worry about helpers as well as events. Now. Uh, I've already built another app here so that we wouldn't waste time doing that. And here, I'm going to show you something else. I'm going to sh now you notice I've changed my templates a little bit. I have a template hello and I've got another template named BG. And BG has a, has a background color change when you click that button. So when the button clicks, it changes the background color from red to white, red to white. Each time the button's clicked, it, it alternates, and I'll show you the JavaScript that makes that happen. And the rest of it, you'll notice that in the template BG, I've now put the template hello. Okay, so templates can contain other templates. And a little later, we're going to see what, exactly how you can use that. But this, uh, when you look at this, I mean, it's also pretty straightforward. You'll notice that 
inside, underneath that, there's this, this other div, and we'll, we'll split it with the JavaScript here. Split with ATL. We'll split it with the JavaScript and take a look here. And you'll notice that, uh, that there's temp template hello helpers and template BG helpers. And you'll notice that BG, the function, you'll notice up there in the thing it says return session get BG. And down here, we're going we're gonna to have the, the, uh, the BG template actually Down here, you'll notice that the style is going to change with the color BG. So uh, we'll uh, come back over here and kill our other one. And we'll start, we'll start this one. You'll notice that it's also starting MongoDB, which is a database that in Meteor, the server has Mongo, uh, a MongoDB running on it, but Meteor also provides a MongoDB written in JavaScript that resides on the client. All right, now that's an interesting thing because any update you do in the client looks like there's no latency at all. You update the database in the client, the client updates its database and it talks in the background back to the server and updates it. So when you install Meteor, you also install MongoDB. You don't have to worry about installing both of them or uh, one of them at a time. They, they're, and if they're there, you can do other things with them. Let's just uh, refresh this now and it'll It'll look the same. I don't know why it's waiting. It changed. It changed? It went back to zero. Yeah. See? Now when you change it, it changes the background. <laughs> Simple thing. So uh, the reason I put that in there was just to show you that you can change the background, you can change the styles, you can change text, you can change data, you can change graphs, you can change whatever you want with very simple statements in your code, in your JavaScript code that's attached to a template. Now, for you Ruby users, one of the things you can do with this is you can put a Meteor application inside an iframe on a web page. So if you want an interactive place on your web page where the user can interact with your system as well as with other users, you can use Meteor to do that. that and that's the reason it fascinated me was there are a number of times when I would like to have that capability where a change a user made to something, a comment he might make to a post, would show up on other people's machines at the same time. And that's what happens because all the databases as well as the session are both automatically reactive inside Meteor. So any change you make locally to the database, your database on your thing, if the other users are subscribed to the same database, they'll get the change as well. Uh, there's very little latency. Once it go, your machine will change right away. The user's machine will see a little bit of a delay because it has to go to the server and make a round trip out again. But what's most interesting about it is that since it runs in Passenger, if you've got a real Rails application also running in Passenger, all the problem you have, might have with WebSockets getting uh, the web sockets to run inside a Rails application on another port, all that's gone away. You can simply put a Meteor application in an iframe and you have that going on. You can even make the iframe invisible and have it going on behind the scenes if you want. So, and deploying is pretty easy. In fact, uh, I don't know how long this is going to last, but the Meteor folks if you write an app and want to see what it looks like, you can just simply deploy it to their server. They'll run it. They won't charge you a nickel for it. <laughs> like I said, I don't know how long that's going to last, but you can develop whatever you like in it 
run it on their server, see how it looks, ask people to look at it if, they want, if you want them to, and you can see what's going on with that. Well, on top of this, I did one, I've added one other application to just to show you what and we'll take a look at this. One of the things I did was Meteor provides lots of different packages to do lots of different things. Uh, one of which is a an accounts UI. It's what, that's what they call it, accounts UI. It's really easy to set up an account system where users can come on with passwords. They also provide an account system for using with Facebook, Twitter, Git, uh, GitHub, and Google. So you can get any one of those combinations or all of them in your, and let people sign on to your site using, say, their Google password and uh, username and password. And so all I did here was add uh, two packages. One, the accounts UI, which is basic to all of them. You have to add that first. And that puts in an entire database system, a uh, database with accounts. And I'll show you how that works in a minute. Um, let me start this. And then we'll take a look at what's going on. Now this one, you'll notice that I now have a template in the body called container. All right, and then if you look down, and I still have the template name, hello, that's still there. I still have the template name, BG. But now all of them are in this template for my container. I have a template container, and then I have a simple if statement. Uh, you'll notice that the if is a little different here. And if logged in, show the rest of the show BG. Right? If not logged in, you're just going to see Welcome to Meteor and the sign in <coughs> link. And that's all I had to do was write that that way as long as I have the accounts UI in it. And we'll take a look at what this thing looks like. It's running. You'll notice the thing says, see if we can make that a little bit bigger. No. There's a sign in thing there, and then you drop that, and there's a couple of things that are there. Sign in, it asks for an email and a password, and I have a user already. But if I wanted to create a user, if I, if I, if you want to create an account, it just says, it gives you another form, create an account. All that's built into Meteor. I'm not, the only code change I made was the change you saw in that HTML file. That's it. As well as a helper to put this. I'll show you that in a second, what the helper looks, or the helper in the event thing looks like. So I'll just put my email address in here. Because I already have my, an account here. Oh, I'm still, <laughs> I want to close that. I want to sign in. I was creating an account. You notice that that's also good because the account already exists and so it, <laughs> the system prevented me from doing it. sign in. And there's our click me. And it's doing the same thing. And you'll notice that my username is up there in the left hand corner. Now you, I, I could show you another site that I built for some people up in DC so they could alter some data. Uh, and I, I have an entirely different form. I mean, you're, you're free to design any form you want, but that's a built in form that comes with the uh, Accounts UI. I mean, it's really quick, but you can design your own forms and background for that. And um, to show you what's going on here, we can go to this directory here, and we'll, we'll just do this. We'll go Meteor Mongo. Okay? And now I'm in the Mongo database that's running behind this thing. And so if I go use Meteor here, it's Mongo.
And if I say show collections, you'll notice that there's a system indices and users. All right, so if I go uh, db.users.find, which is a pretty straightforward, well, there's, there's my user account. All right, so you'll notice I'm accessing outside of, I, I just went to the directory and access it that way. So if you've got a Rails program going and you can also access the MongoDB with your Rails, any alterations you make in that database if the Mongo, uh, if the Meteor subscriber in your application is subscribed to the database, and that's the method they use, there's a publish and subscribe method. The server decides what it's going to publish, and that you can design your clients to subscribe to various databases that are there. And in that, if I made a change in here and users were a list of users were somewhere, and I made a change in this database with a Rails app or some other outside app the Meteor app would update itself directly with the change in the database. There's, uh, I mean, that's just built into, uh, into Meteor. So we can exit this thing. And um, I want to show you a couple other little applications that, that I have running, one of which I have a, I work with a graphics designer in Washington, D.C., who is HTML illiterate. And I know that sounds strange, but she is. And she doesn't want to know anything about HTML. She's a wonderful designer, and she does a lot of stuff. She sends me a lot of stuff, pictures, you know. I developed this in Photoshop. Can you, make, can you design a web page or put a web page together that looks like this and does these things? Well, I'm kind of tired of dealing with things like that. I, I'm trying to get her, encourage her, uh, trying to find a way to build a tool where she can at least draw graphs for me and just send me the code. And uh, so I've been working with uh, D3 and some other things to uh, get this application up and running. And we're gonna, I'm going to show you what it looks like, too, here in a second. We'll just, we can not worry about that right now. We'll go over here to this one. And this one, I'm using um, this particular application. And that's, you stop with the control C. This particular application is using uh, what Meteor calls their iron router. And when I start showing you the, out, the layout of the code and things like that, you're going to say, well, it looks just like Rails or something like Rails, because it really does. Um, they have their own conventions. And um, we'll just go over to that application right now. And I'm going to run this under Passenger, just to show you what happened. When I'm running Meteor just as Meteor, it's only available on the local host. It binds itself to local host. It's not accessible from outside your machine. The nice thing about Passenger is you can run Passenger, and pa it'll run inside a Passenger, and Passenger does bind itself to 0, 0, 0, 0 at, at port 3000, or you can change that port if you want. that right arrow is a broken pipe is this thing <laughs> that's still there. And uh, so if we, uh, I'll just close this and, and open a new tab. There's a graphic uh, program that's running under passenger there. And uh, that graphic at the top is, believe it or not, is a, micros is a microscopic image of a moth's wing. In case you're wondering what those look like really close up, but that, that's what it is. Anyway, this thing allows you to choose a, I have a sample CSV file, which I'm still fooling around with. And that media reads that local, that CSV file right there on my, locally on my machine. I'm not bringing that in from the server, it's there. I can, you notice I have a thing where you can download it here, uh, the sample CSV. And it's got an x-axis and a y-axis, and if I choose this thing, It'll ask me what, how do I want to do it. I'm a category, and all, I'll show you that all these things are also. Um, and then this is the one I want to look at. This happens to be uh, data on natural gas storage, which is an area that 
I work in. And, uh, and basically, this, this thing has uh, 241 records in it, the CSV file. Uh, but I can choose. I'm not, I'm not going to show all of them. I'm just going to show um, a couple. There's the graph. See, it, it, <laughs> it drew it pretty fast. I notice I, I, there's no round trip between servers or anything else. I'm using a, a D3 library, the dimple charts, which is another library that fits into it. And I wrote another library that's a class that feeds into dimple charts. So, and the reason I did that is I wanted something that was reactive, like the session that we talked about, and was reactive like the database, but neither. It's simply the chart options that are available for this chart. And uh, so with this chart, there are lots of things you can do with it. Uh, for example, uh, if I wanted lines, instead of, instead of that, I could get a line chart. All right, and all that's doing is saying, OK, he clicked on that button. There's a temp template helper over there that says, uh, not a helper, but an events function that says, hey, this button was clicked. What do I do with it? Change the graph type and replot it. The same thing is true if I wanted to choose colors or uh, if I wanted to choose the width. And instead of 500, I wanted to make it 800. I can do that. It will widen the thing out, change the layout on it. If I, I, can take the, I can take the markers off, too. You don't want markers, just a line. Uh, if I want to plot another one with it, like this is a uh, moving average of the injections. If I wanted to plot the injections, both of them would be lines. There's another data set that's there already that I read in that I, I make a combination chart. But anyway, once this person gets done with this, designing her chart, I want her to do, there's a couple of things she could do. One, I can export it as a ping, uh, PNG file. And this is a PNG file. You can just copy and paste it in an email. You can take the, the file and save it out of Chrome so you can use it in another website. Uh, and basically, I'd use HTML5. It draws the, the chart, really a SVG file, but it draws it on the canvas. And all I'm doing is reading the canvas now that it's rasterized and rasterizing it. That's basically all this goes on, and, makes, and it makes that. And it's also, the other thing is, that's the code that draws the chart. First, the first block is the data. And you'll notice it's a big JSON object. And the second block down here is the graph options. In other words, as we clicked on all these things, these are the things that wrote in the options things. So there are two things. If I'm, on the, if I'm sharing this with her, we're both on the system together. And she's drawing this. And uh, we're pulling these things out of a database instead of out of a file, which is what it's doing right now. I would have this already on my machine. I can just copy and paste it into another piece of code. And that chart would be there. And since it's a D3 chart, and the library that's using it is, uses this, it'll also update itself automatically. So that's the coolest part about the thing is that you can do these kinds of things. And you'll notice that I'm not making any round trips to the server. It's very fast. Uh, I find it extremely, uh, a thing that will become extremely useful down the road for any interactive page. Now, most of the time, what I've seen are at least on the Meteor forums, their uh, blog programs, to-do lists, things like that. I see a lot of applications in things where mark people are interacting in markets, where there's bidding going on. This kind, of a, this kind of a system would be very, very useful for that because everyone would be up to date all the time. Any changes made locally would change everywhere else. You can control who has access to what parts of the database by the way you publish it. There's code right in Meteor that says, all right, look, only publish this. And here are three fields in the database that the user can't see. Unless the user has these privileges, then he could see that. I mean, you can write code that, that kind of restricts the way the database is accessed. One of the things to warn you about is that when you start a Meteor project, this one's not that way, but when, it, when I initially started it, Anytime you use a database in Meteor, they have a thing called auto-publish, which means every piece of data that's in the database that the server knows about is published. 
and all the privileges on that data are also available to whoever wants to come in. So you open the JavaScript console and start changing the data around without a problem at all. Not just on your machine, but on the user's machine. Now you can turn that off, and they recommend that you do, but it's, it's kind of buried in the documentation. You're reading along, all of a sudden you go, what? <laughs> this is going on? I'm, <laughs> that it's totally available? No. So I mean, it's just a warning that if you start using it, you want to be aware of that. Now, uh, I want to show you uh, just for a moment the structure of what this, the way this thing's laid out. And because I use Iron Router, you'll notice that there's the directory here. This is the directory of the project itself. There's a bundle, and I'll, when you when you deploy Meteor in a production mode, basically when you say deploy. Meteor writes code and, and actually develops a bundle directory. And what it does is it takes all the JavaScript that you have, all of it, okay, puts it, minifies it all, minifies the CSS, combines all the JavaScript in one big file. So it gets very difficult to, to piece through it once it's in production. And it's very difficult for the user to, find, to, to look through it as well because it's just a really big pile of JavaScript because I have jQuery in here as one of the libraries. <laughs> That's in there too, minified, crammed in with all the other JavaScript. So looking at the file itself is not an easy way to look at, at what's going on. But you'll notice that I have a thing called the client. I don't have a server directory in here right now. I have a client. And that's all the code in that client directory runs on the client. And in my lib here, You'll notice I just have one JavaScript, that's router.js, and if I, I'll just cat it. You'll notice that it uh, looks pretty much pretty similar to a Rails router, <laughs> you know, yeah, just casually. And uh, template is a layout, right? And so if we go, if we go back up into the client, And we go to uh, templates. What? Got fat fingers today. You want to see the application? These guys must have been Ruby programmers at one time. Boy, I can't type. And there's the layout HTML. And if I cat layout, uh, if I cat, you'll notice <laughs> you've seen that before too, All right? So this none of this should be too new to you guys. I mean, you've seen most of these things before in in, in Rails as well, and it just yields and it yields to the other templates that you have. And you'll notice that the way they're laid out is also very similar to a, a Rails project. You'll notice that there are various templates that are in them in that I've got combined here. There's a, a a file reader, a line options. When I first wrote this code, I had them all in one big JavaScript. And man, I'm like, I was still fooling around trying to figure my way through this. And when I got in there, <laughs> it was like, wait, where is everything? I mean, I'm, it's taking me forever to find it. So I decided to use a router instead. And in the router. It's pretty easy to organize, and 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 so those are like views. The these and they're HTML, uh, and then you'll notice that those the JS are also similar names to the to the views, which is also somewhat Rails-like. Um, it's sort of like a controller, but it's really not a controller. It's simply JavaScript that's, that's attached to all those templates. And in every one of them, like if you look at uh, uh, the chart options, we'll look at that for a second. Where the heck's the underscore?
There it is. You'll notice that there's a lot of things in there. There's a template chart option. There's a helpers. There's lots of helpers in there because all the options that are in there, that when I was changing the colors, when I was changing the size and the width and the height, those are all, see the chart height, return graph options, chart height. Well, graph options happens to be an object that's, that I've made reactive. So any changes I make to the chart option, anything that revive, any change that I make into chart, in the chart options, like if I make the change in the height, since this one's listening to height, this helper immediately gets fired. Okay, and in the chart options template, the height value changes. So uh, you'll notice that I haven't had to worry too much about connections other than, hey, here's some, some variables and here's some events. Uh, uh, linking them together was pr is pretty easy and it's very fast. I mean, you can put things together really quickly uh, to make these things change like this. Uh, the fact that it runs under passenger is, a, uh, to me, a big deal because it's pretty easy to deploy. This is not, e this is not easy if you use Red Hat's OpenShift. It's not, and I do use Red Hat's OpenShift. It's not easy to deploy there. Oh, it's just unbelievable headache. And the reason is, is that <clears throat> Meteor changes the node version that it requires every time it updates itself, and Red Hat OpenShift doesn't. <laughs> so you have to specify it in, a, in another file that you want this version of node running, and so it just gets to be a headache. But other than that, if you deploy it to Meteor's site, it'll just deploy right away, I mean, no problem, and it's readily available there uh, as a production. So it's free, and it's op everything in it's open is MIT licensed, so you can do pretty much whatever you want to do with, uh, with the code, any changes you want to make to it, adaptations you want to make to it. Uh, if you're if you're going to run it, I would uh, I was going to bring a Sinatra application in here with a with a with an E-frame or I-frame in it that had uh, a meteor application. I just didn't get around to it uh, to get it done. So anyway, if if you have an interest in it, it's they've got tremendous. Actually, the documentation is tremendous. There's a Ruby. There's a meteor users group here in Atlanta that's met only once. Uh, it's amazing. They had 30 people there. When Meteor announced they came out with version 1.0, they're now at 1.03.2, I believe. And, um, oh, one other thing. If you're interested in a, a mobile app or developing a mobile app, Meteor makes packages available for both Android and iOS. So you can add a package. You just simply say Meteor add and a package name. And it'll get added to your application. So you could take any one of these applications I had right now and generate an Android app with the same application just simply by adding those things and perhaps maybe five lines of code. And all of a sudden you have a, a, a mobile app as well. So I, I think it's a really good library. I think a lot of Ruby programmers can make use of it and make your sites better simply by incorporating it as an iframe. That's the only way you can do it because the server is a Javis is Node. I mean, it's Node.js. That is the server, and uh, you can, it, it comes bundled that way. That's the way it's set up. Okay, so I'm ready for any questions you might have, or if not, oh, yes. Um, I was wondering. I know the. Yeah, you gotta wait for the mic. <laughs> I can hear you. <laughs> Uh, so, since the database is also on the client side, is it possible to only load a subset of your data or have a smaller database that you use? Yeah, there's uh, some latency with the, with the data that gets loaded, but when, when you subscribe though, you can, rather than doing big finds, which will load lots of stuff into, and cache into the database, just do small finds and narrow things and you don't, the latency just, it's okay. still there, but. So could you you could could you only load recent changes? No, you can load what's ever in. Let's put it this way: at the server side, mm -hmm. you publish uh, a, a meet, what they call a collection, a meteor collection or a Mongo collection. It's simply like the users that you can publish that as a database. 
All right, as a, as a table. I worked on a, a, this was about a year ago, and it's not very fresh in my mind, but I worked on a meteor side project with someone that was a chat room app. Mm -hmm. So we had, um, you could type in text and it would appear to only people in your right. chat room. Right. And so I was just, I was curious in like the context of that, would you have every message everyone's ever sent on the client side? No. It would only be or the only ones that the server allowed you to subscribe to. Okay. The service may, server may publish it, but it may only publish things that were you're in a group. Let's say it's a, you designated as a group inside the database that you belong to a group. The server would say, okay, this user knows who you are, right? This user belongs to this group. He can, this user can see these messages or these posts or these prices or whatever you might want to exclude from. And you can specify which fields the user can see. All right, so somebody may have a conversation with uh, another group somewhere, you might not ever be able to see the, those fields in your group for that user. I mean, you can restrict it that way if you wanted to. Yeah, so you can tighten it up as much as you want. You can limit what the user sees. You can limit uh, uh, not just, you can, you can limit it to the dates. Okay, so when you name your collection, like if you want to name your collection uh, posts on uh, Atlanta rug, Okay, for, and we're just doing current posts, so it'll just be the last three days. So the server would publish just the last three days of Atlanta Rug posts. And the user would subscribe to that database name, that's the way you'd write the code. The subscription would be to that collection. And once you made a request to that collection, the server would respond according to the rules it has to respond to. So you write your own rules, the user, uh, and you write your, your subscription for the user. That's why you want it. One of the reasons you don't want this auto run or auto, uh, auto publish going on because the user could say, <laughs> heck with those rules, <laughs> right? And yeah, I'm an own. admin now, right? Yeah, so you have to worry about it, yeah. Right. Or you could just restrict it to admins, right? There are, ad there are a number of libraries out there that, that uh, have roles now where they put roles in the, uh, along with the users that's in addition to the standard Meteor thing, but there's a bunch of them out on GitHub, but tons of them. I'm surprised there's that much going on, and yet you rarely see Meteor showing up as a, as a web app. Thank so you. There, there is, there, there's a lot of basic development going on. Yeah? I just wanted to know if you knew of any prominent examples of Meteor apps that are No, I don't. Well, I know that product time is like, Based on the meteor sample app, I've never seen that website. Mm -hmm. Okay. Product hunt? Uh, telescope. Yeah, there's one. What? Telescope? Is yeah. That how you, yeah, I think so. Yeah, there, not, nothing that's taken the world by storm, though. Uh, there are some people doing a lot of stuff with uh, games uh, on mobile apps. Uh, at the last, the only meteor group that I've been to, the only one that I know about, there was a fellow there who used to be a Ruby programmer who was writing a, a game and he was passing around. He had several iPads there with him and people were playing the game right there in the group. Uh, and he w basically he was using uh, Cordova, which is Apache's mobile library. And um, oh, as far as testing goes, I know everyone here is in love with testing. Uh, there's a, you can use, there's, there's actually, uh, there are libraries for using Cucumber and uh, Jasmine. So if you're, if you're doing development by uh, testing, you, it's, it's available there, even in Meteor, uh, no problem. It, I don't know if this thing's gonna take off and become really prevalent. All, all I know is it's really easy to develop a, a, the front end on a website and the back end that merges with it pretty quickly. So. If nothing else, it's going to be competition for Rails down the line if it actually develops. And Rails programmers actually could use it inside the Rails application as, as it stands. Okay, doke. Thank you very much. This video has been sponsored by Rietta Incorporated. Learn more today at rietta.com.